Thank you everyone for being here today. We are very excited to kick off our 2020 Chicago Go Red, Go STEM digital experience. We will begin the program shortly.
Before we get started today, let's kick it off with a pop quiz brought to you by Heron Consulting. Go ahead and use the chat box to answer the two questions. Okay, here is the first question, everyone. The mission of the American Heart Association is A, to be a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives, B, to help educate and empower individuals around their heart health, C, to ensure that our workforce, workplace, and mission have a shared impact across America's diverse populations, or D, all of the above. Well, if you answered D, you are correct. Here is the second question. We know that heart disease is a women's number one health threat. Why is it important to take charge of your heart health? A, because half of women are affected. B, because one in three women are affected. C, because three in five women are affected. Or D, none of the above. I'm seeing the answer stream in here. But if you answered B, because one in three women are affected, you are correct. All right, sit tight everyone and we will begin the program shortly.
Okay, good morning, everyone. This is meteorologist Cheryl Scott. We are trying to get my video up and running for you. So hopefully that happens here in the next couple of minutes. Um, I just wanna welcome everyone to today. We are super excited and super pumped to be here together digitally. I wish we were face to face, but thank you so much for being with us digitally today. Welcome to the fifth annual Chicago Go Red, Go STEM event. My name is Cheryl Scott, and you may recognize me as your local meteorologist. All right, I am starting my video up here for you guys. Awesome. I think that we are connected and so happy to virtually see all of you. And I'm just so honored to be here with all of you today. Being a meteorologist, the study of the atmosphere, I know the importance of science. I use it every day from forecasting Chicago's ever-changing weather to monitoring our accelerating climate change. And meteorology is just one STEM field of many that there is to choose from. Today is all about ensuring that more women like you are at the forefront of developing science, technology, engineering, and math solutions and careers. And this has never been more imperative. STEM is our future. And I wanna state this important fact. Science is not a boy's game. It's not a girl's game. It's everyone's game. But there is a troubling gender gap that exists in STEM from the lack of women pursuing STEM related degrees to the number of women in STEM careers. The more females we get involved in the world of science, the further we advance. And that's why I'm here today to hopefully excite you just a little bit to explore opportunities in science related fields. I know there is a ton of potential in all of you. So always remember to dream big and anything is possible. So here's a little bit about my background. Now I got involved in a STEM field, my passion and love for weather. It all started when I was a little girl. Has anyone here seen the movie, The Wizard of Oz? Yep. Well, that is the reason I fell in love with weather. It all stemmed from that one tornado scene. After I saw that movie, I became enamored with the atmosphere and wanted to learn how it all worked. I even wrote in my eighth grade yearbook, I plan to become a meteorologist. I am very, very fortunate that I am living my dream, but I do have to say it didn't come easy. I spent hours in the classroom and labs. I worked around the clock, especially in college to keep up with my studies. And I was not even close to being the smartest person in my classroom, but I worked really hard and I'm glad I did because now I get to live my passion through my career. Meteorology is at times a very tricky subject. The atmosphere is based off of many mathematical equations, physics and calculus galore. We use math and numbers every day on the job. Not only do we forecast the weather and try to predict the future, we are also responsible for our on-air graphics that you see on the news daily and keeping up with the latest computer technology. And at the end of the day, it is a very rewarding job. And I feel proud as a female to be a lead meteorologist in one of the biggest weather markets in the country, Chicago. Women make up just 29% of all weather caster positions and females only make up 8% of chief meteorologist, meteorologist positions. Only 8% of meteorologists on the evening newscasts are female. We are beginning to see more females enter this field, but there's definitely room for more credible degreed meteorology female students. And this is a common theme found in careers in STEM. So today, our mission, let's STEM it up. I hope you're as excited as we are to debut this new digital experience so we can continue to inspire, change, and make history even as we adapt to the ever-changing environment. While we can't be together face-to-face, -face, we can be a relentless force together through digital events made possible by advances in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We have an amazing program planned for today. Thank you all so much for joining. We also want you to get social today and use the hashtag Chicago Goes Red. And post about your experience. 
Did you know that only 25% of the workforce are women who fill a role in a STEM field? Only 25%. As a science-based organization, the American Heart Association wants more women around the table filling these roles, receiving our research grants, and ultimately helping make the next medical breakthrough that will eliminate heart disease once and for all. I'd now like to introduce this year's Go Red, Go STEM chairwoman, Heather Nelson. Thank you so much, Cheryl. We are so thrilled to have you here with us today. My name is Heather Nelson, and I'm this year's Go Red, Go STEM chairwoman. Ladies, I am involved in this campaign because it is so important for all of you to know that you can and you do make an impact in your communities. Being able to have this time together in this forum to talk about what the AHA does to support heart, re heart health, as well as discuss with all of you the opportunities, much like Cheryl, Cheryl did in the STEM fields, is the bright spot of this crazy year we've had. As the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer of the UChicago Medicine, I am proud to serve and support the Southside communities here in Hyde Park by delivering quality patient care and research. The American Heart Association funds some of our research and I am certain that this research will continue to blaze trails and find new therapies to beat heart disease and stroke. I realize that some of you um, today, this is your first time in your first introduction to the American Heart Association and our Go Red for Women movement. What many of you don't know is heart disease is the number one killer of women. It causes one in three women's death each year, more than any forms of cancer combined. Go Red for Women is a movement that started in 2004 as a way to educate women that heart disease is their number one threat and provide tools and resources to live longer, healthier lives. We are here today because we are committed to fighting for health equity for all women. Because of this movement, fewer women are dying from heart disease. Because of this campaign, and the research has been funded and awareness for lifestyle changes, 285 fewer women are dying from heart disease each day. Unfortunately, we are still seeing a rise in heart disease for middle-aged women, but science shows that with lifestyle changes like managing your weight, exercising, and not smoking, and taking care of your emotional health, you can control much of your risk of heart disease. We also know that when we gather around the table with the scientists, researchers, and engineers that can help us make a difference, there's not many women there. Women are drastically underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and math, and that means that there's a wealth of talent out there and we're not harnessing. We created this day five years ago called Go Red, Go STEM as a way to solve these problems by fostering new talent and helping to marry heart health, education, and STEM career opportunities. I do wanna take a moment to thank some very important people for making today happen. There are sponsors and leaders who donate to ensure you all have the opportunity to participate today. And we have a group of leaders from these companies who will be leading our sessions and, and, and our speed mentoring. Thank you all so very much. And lastly, I want you all to know that today is about you and your ability to own your future and change the world. We have brought together some amazing leaders from all around Chicago who will talk with you about your heart health and career opportunities in a STEM field. Enjoy the experience and be relentless in the pursuit of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, for your leadership and dedication to this cause. Before we get into our mentoring session, let's try another pop quiz. Today's event was designed to provide you with the insights into the possibilities and potential to make an impact on the world around you in health and career. What is the goal of the Go Red, Go STEM initiative? A, increase the number of women pursuing STEM degrees in higher education. 
B, close the gender gap in STEM jobs. C, arm students with tools and resources to experience good health and well being. D, all of the above. Use the chat box to answer, everyone. Awesome, I see all of your answers streaming in. If you answer D to all of the above, you are correct. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Go Red, Go STEM is an important initiative for the American Heart Association to ensure more women are at the forefront of the sciences, especially those of color. What percentage of STEM jobs are female? A, 24%, B, 12%, C, 50%, or D, 3%. Yes, I am seeing a lot of correct answers stream in. If you answered a 24%, you are correct. Thank you so much for participating in these quizzes today. We have brought together some amazing leaders from around the Chicago area who will talk with you about your heart health and career opportunities in a STEM field. And I am thrilled to be participating in the session as a mentor. Without further ado, let's get this session started. Great, thank you everybody mentors. Now is your time to shine. If you haven't already, please turn your video on. Um, our backend folks will be having you all join us on screen in a moment. And students, now is your time to ask questions. We have an incredible group of individuals who are here today for all of you. If you wanna start by maybe sharing some of the schools that you're from so that our mentors can see where you all are joining us from, that would be great just to start getting the juices flowing in the chat box. This is going to work by having the students share questions in the chat box. Mentors, um, I will call on you um, as you raise your hand so you can answer the question. If you wanna share your name and what company you work for, that would be great. Um, our goal through this is to answer as many questions as we can from as many students as possible and certainly give as many of you an opportunity to join in. So with no further ado, students, if you want to start entering in some questions, things like, what was your first job? Um, what type of classes should I take if I'm interested in engineering? Or if you heard Cheryl earlier, what inspired you to be in the job that you're in today? I'm sure the mentors would love to share some of the non-traditional ideas and ways that they got interested in their um, their job. So I'll let you all start adding in your questions to the chat and mentors hang tight. I'll call on you to answer some of the first questions. Okay, I think, here we go. All right. McKenna, I see, did you know right away the specific field of STEM that you wanted to pursue? If not, how did you determine which field to pursue in particular? Heather, you're our lead today. I'll let you take the first question and answer it for the girls, thanks. Thanks so much, McKenna, for that question. So right away, I knew I wanted to be um, in the STEM field. Um, specifically, I wanted to be a doctor. And uh, as I entered into my college career and started taking classes in the science, um, I figured out, you know what? Uh, maybe not being a doctor is, uh, is right for me. So what I ended up in, and I ended up in IT. And I like to say in IT, we're the people that take care of the people that take care of patients. So I came into this role very untraditionally, but am so proud of the fact that in IT, we really do support um, the research and the, and the care that's being uh, done here at UChicago Medicine. Great, thank you, Heather. Okay, let's go to Allison's question. What sort of classes and extracurriculars did you take that encouraged you to do STEM. So 
So mentors, if you want to go on video, raise your hand. I'm happy to call on you, call on somebody who's interested in answering that question for us. Again, what sort of classes or extracurriculars did you take that encourage you to do STEM? Hope, do you want to take this one for the students? Thanks. Yeah, so when I started college, I actually didn't know that I wanted to be in science. I had a lot of different interests and a lot of things that I actually did fairly well in. So it was, it was a little bit difficult for me to decide. I thought I was going to do something more like international relations or art history. Um, but as part of my college curriculum, I had to take some science classes. And when I first took biology, I just fell in love. So I think what, what I would suggest is, is just try a lot of different things. I, you know, I did that as well as I worked in, um, similar to, um, the last speaker, Heather, I worked in the, the, um, computer lab and also loved that too. And, and that actually kind of, um, worked out for me because in my career, I use science and I also use uh, computer science. I'm a data scientist at Livongo Health. So my advice would be to just try a lot of things, even things that you don't think are going to interest you. Perfect, thanks Hope. Is there another mentor who'd wanna add on to that question for us, Beth? So yeah, I'd echo what Hope said too and say, uh, you don't know what you like until you try it, right? So I, I know when I started college, I, I literally went to the um, activity and club fair and signed up for like as many things as my schedule could handle. Um, and some of them fell off the wayside, but I was glad I tried it. But then I found a lot of clubs and, and other activities that I was really passionate about. So finding things like, uh, and maybe weren't necessarily related to STEM, but uh, things like jazz band and, and ultimate Frisbee. Uh, we had a math club that was kind of kind of neat too. Um, and being part of those activities helps, uh, helps you with networking too, which is a really important thing as you're trying to develop in your career, especially in these STEM fields. Great, thank you. Okay, I love this question from Lily. Since STEM is such a competitive field, how can we make sure our college applications stand out? I love that question. Who can help answer that? Yvette? Oh, Yvette, you're on oh, mute. There you go. Great. There we go. So I, I was fortunate. I had, um, my dad was in the healthcare field, but what I did all through high school is I just did a lot of shadowing. And it, it, I think for my application, it just demonstrated interest in the healthcare field. I did everything from working in an admissions department in a hospital or um, shadowing um, a physician for a half day. Um, I even went out with um, some biotech salespeople. So I think it, it just boosted up my application, just demonstrating interest in those fields as well as taking um, classes like I loved anatomy and physiology. That was the first thing that turned me on um, into the healthcare or science field. Um, so taking those kind of classes in high school also I think was helpful. But just getting exposure because you don't necessarily know exactly what you want to do. So it's just seeing what other real life people do in their life and what their day um, entails of. And it kind of puts things in the bucket and takes things out of the bucket in terms of where your interests lie. Thanks for that. Janice, do you want to add on to that for us? Yeah, I'll pile on to what Yvette was saying and, and also add on volunteering. I think um, any opportunity you can get to uh, try something out and get that experience is something that stands out on any resume, whether that's going for your college applications or even uh, down the road career-wise. And it also gives you an opportunity to lead in some ways as well. So if you get to volunteer, you can, uh, you can take on being the one who leads the change and leads the charge as well. And it, so those opportunities here with the American Heart Association or anywhere else to just pitch in and help always stands out to me with young people to show that they are committed and, and have a desire to learn and be uh, able to exhibit your passion for things. So anything that you do get into, make sure you do it with all your heart. Love that, thanks. We're gonna keep going with some more questions. 
Um, what from Ashley? I love this one. Ashley White, thank you. What is your biggest challenge as a woman in STEM and how did you overcome it? Great question. Taylor, would you leave this one for us? Sure. Yeah, that is a, an amazing question. Um, I think my biggest challenge, and especially as I was going through college, I went to a university that I think it was 10% of us were women in STEM. Um, and so the biggest challenge was just being the only female in the room in a lot of my group projects and a lot of my uh, classes and making sure that my voice uh, still got heard. And the biggest thing that helped me overcome that was one, having confidence in my ideas, even when maybe other people didn't. And also if there other or the, if there were other women in the room, making sure that I amplify those voices as well and really making sure that I support them and that they support me in turn to make sure that we're all being heard and we're all moving forward. Great, thank you so much. All right, next question we have. I think this is a really important question. Have you experienced any discrimination or other struggles simply for being a woman in STEM? And I'll add on to that maybe, how did you handle that moving forward? I'll, I'll take, oh, go ahead, Rika, go ahead. Hi, hi guys. Great, so, thanks. Hi, so uh, in my previous company, there was a client who, uh, and a 60 year old something man who would just refuse to work with me as, as soon as I entered the conference room or if we had a meeting. So he would not directly connect with me. So this is something that happened and without any fault of mine or my teammates or my manager. So the thing that I realized was, it wasn't that he was not connecting with me because I was a woman, but it was more because he thought I'm a fresher, uh, straight out of college. I might not have any experience on what we were working on. So that was something that I experienced. And that is something that I noticed from the meetings that we had to sit with him. And what I realized was, if you work on the skills, so there was a particular skill, let's say SQL that we were working on, and he assumed that I would not know it. But in the meetings, if I go and if I uh, do a presentation and represent my skills there, and that is how he started noticing me. And that is how he started connecting with me and he would be, and eventually everything was uh, like normal and everybody would interact with me, even him. So that is how, like, you have to represent and you have to uh, work on your skills first and not let anybody else let you down or not let anybody else uh, make you feel that you're not important as a woman or as a fresher, whichever is the case. Know your skill, uh, skills, hone your skills, and just go there with confidence and things will work out. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Okay, who has been, from Jasmine, who has been your biggest supporter when deciding to enter such a competitive field? And just how important is networking when it comes to the STEM field? Let's see here, who can help us with this one? Jen, Jen Curtis? Good morning, everyone. I'm Jen Curtis with Schneider Electric. For me, actually, the biggest advocate was a professor of mine. I started taking math classes in high school at a local college, and she asked me if I'd ever heard of engineering, and I hadn't. And she walked me through it, and she helped me. She didn't need to do that, right? I think it was um, her trying to do her part and expose to me a STEM career and STEM field that I hadn't thought about. And so I think that I know for sure when I walked in class that day that I wasn't expecting that impromptu mentoring and coaching. So I would say sometimes it comes from the most unexpected places, um, but certainly look to those that are advocates for you from the get-go to help shape where you wanna go and feel free to ask questions too. So for me, it was a professor. Great, thanks, Jen. And does anybody want to add to that? Janelle, I think your hand was up as well. Yeah, hello, everyone. Yeah, I, I will, I think, just double down a little bit on what Jennifer was saying. Um, I think one of the best things that you can do to guide your career 
not only in STEM, but throughout is really just to find people who believe in you and ask them and encourage them to be your mentor. So mine actually started first with actually a high school chemistry teacher who kind of just took me under his wing and, and showed me and led me to believe that I was capable of, of you know, entering this field and being competitive in a STEM field. Uh, and then certainly continued through college with, uh, with really one of my managers who also believed in me and saw the you know, uh, potential that I had and really just guided my career and helped me believe uh, in myself, in my abilities and really led the way. So I think network, you know, the answer to networking and mentoring absolutely is really important. Find people who believe in you, who will encourage you, who will help guide your way because uh, it's gonna be really important and really helpful to have those people to lean on uh, when, you, when you get a little lost or you're a little concerned or you don't really quite know where you're headed. It's very important. Great, and I think what's important to call out students is you all now have this wonderful network of mentors um, who you can reach out to. Of course, if you're um, able to, you can reach out to them directly here while you're in the chat. You can change the chat to send any of them a private message. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions that you have during this time we have together. So don't feel limited by the questions and answers that we're calling out. Um, feel free to message them directly. I have a, a question from Saya, and it's due to the pandemic. Many students aren't able to do internships like they were supposed to this year. What other ways can we stand out on college applications? I think also maybe if we can touch on what opportunities they might have open to them right now with different companies and organizations, that would be great to share with them too. Yvonne, if you wanna share, thanks. I think that's a great question and I think it, it is a difficult time and I think we all have to get our um, creative hats on. So what I would suggest is, and of course this isn't a proven, uh, proven to work because none of us knows what's gonna, what's gonna happen on the other side of this, but I think there's tremendous value in just taking coursework online that's outside of your normal curriculum from school. So whether that, if you're interested in technology as an example, uh, Microsoft offers all kinds of certification courses that anyone can take, and you can actually get a certification while you're still in high school. They're, they're, they don't, you're not required to have a college degree to, to learn those things or to uh, keep track and take uh, listen to courses. If you're interested in astronomy, there's all kinds of classes, and universities are offering classes online where you don't get a grade, but you get to consume content or TED Talks. There's, all, there's such a, a wealth of information that's now available on the internet uh, that you can start to consume and start to show uh, you know, your interest and curiosity and how you're applying it. Uh, and I think that that can go uh, a long way in, in having you stand out, shows initiative as well as uh, curiosity and interest. That's really great advice. And I would say it's not limited to just our students, right? I think all of us are in the same boat with them that we're looking for opportunities to learn and grow. And, you know, great for us to share with them that we're, we're kind of in the same boat as they are, right? Absolutely. Does anybody want to add to that as well, Marianne? Hi, um, Marianne Hood from BMO Harris. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, I think that all of those suggestions were, were great. And I would certainly encourage everyone to follow them. I'd like to add a few more things as well. We actually went ahead with our intern program. It was, uh, I work in technology at BMO Harris. We did it completely virtually. It was, it was interesting, um, but we did, uh, we did find the program a success. And there were a couple of things that the participants did um, that really stood out that in addition to their intern program, um, a couple of them had very, um, very effective uh, charitable activities going on where they were actually leading um, in their communities. And especially during the pandemic, there were lots of areas where you could find uh, where communities needed assistance. Uh, the other thing was a couple of them had online businesses, albeit small, they had their sort of online uh, businesses on the side that were definitely showing their skills in, in terms of not only leadership, but in, from a technology point of view, how to set up and maintain those. So I think over, and we're just about to start our next intern program. We're just going out to the universities, colleges, et cetera. So I don't think the, um, the intern avenue is going to be as effective, uh, affected as we thought. We're still going to be going forward with it. It's a great opportunity. And certainly if you 
see internship programs with any of us in places where we work, uh, please ping me. I'll, I'll help you at least get an, an interview. Um, and yeah, I think it's still a great road to, to build your skills. Fantastic. Thank you, Marianne. Okay, the elephant in the room. This is a women's event, women empowerment, but of course we have some great men joining us today to encourage all of you um, around health and career as well. So Eric and Paul, I'm gonna look to you to answer some questions for the girls. Um, I think this is a good one. Um, how would you, oh, I'm sorry, whoops. If you did extracurriculars from Kayla, if you did extracurricular such as club sports, how hard or easy was it to juggle your studies with practicing your sport? So maybe share a little bit about work-life balance with them. Eric, I'll let you go first. Oh, for sure. You know, and, uh, you know, I have a, a daughter who's a sophomore at St. Lucia University and she, you know, so I'll, I'll share it from her perspective. She is on the club swim team. And last year she was able to travel to various uh, universities and really get, you know, kind of you know, almost like a simulated, um, you know, you know, athletic experience being on a, a university team, but on, uh, via a club. And what she would share with us as a family is being involved in those extracurriculars really helped her stay focused. It gave her a good schedule. It gave her, um, you know, just really created structure in her day that she knew she had to really take advantage of open windows of time. So I think whether it's, um, you know, you're playing a D1, D2, D3 sport, or whether you go down there and just pursue your passions of sport, aside from your academics, it's just, it's critical to find things that are going to keep you, um, you know, energized, that are going to keep you in tune with what's going on around the university. I, I loved it. You know, I, I'm going years back on my own personal experience, but we played intramural um, sports all year round. And it was just a great outlet to go on out there, not only in, and get your exercise, but to meet new friends, to increase that network of people that you knew around campus. So it's, I think it's something that's vitally important for young students going into college to find other things they're excited about, not just not just school, but whether it's a sport, whether it's a club, whether it's a volunteer event. You know, one of my greatest passions at uh, University of Illinois, where I went to school, was uh, for two years ran the Big Brother Little Brother program on campus, and you, you just you get to see, um, you know, just the impact that you can make on young students in the community's lives too. So just, there's a lot of things you can do to find on campus that will balance out not only your academic interests, but your, just your life pursuits as well. And would encourage you all to, to really find those things you're excited about and, and just jump in when you have those opportunities. Great advice. Thanks, Eric. And Cheryl, I think I know that maybe you were a D1 athlete too. Maybe you can piggyback off of Eric's response and some of the the sports and um, and school balance for us. Yeah, so I ran track my entire life, and actually, sports helped me get into the college that I wanted to go with the academics combined. I ended up going to Brown University. I ran track there for four years at D1 school, and I was also majoring in geological sciences. So there was a lot to get through each and every day, but. As he just said, it really is all about um, finding ways to keep your mind open and also scheduling and keeping to a routine. And I think it's really important to not just sit in the classroom all day, to make sure you get involved. I had some of my best times on the track. Those are some of my best friends that I made. And that was an extra support system that I had each and every day. But not only that, sports or any type of extracurricular activity will be a huge, huge um, uh, relief sometimes from the classroom and the stress, especially when it comes to our cell phones and the computers and social media these days where we're sitting in front of our phones and all of these things that are taking away from what we could be doing just to take a little bit of a break from a mental standpoint. So I just think it's so important if you are into extracurricular activities as well as STEM, you can definitely you know, just figure out a way to manage both. And there are so many people out there that can help your advisors, your teammates, your classmates that can, you know, really encourage you and keep you on the path to being able to do all of these things at once, because it really goes hand in hand. I can't tell you how many times I was stuck in the classroom or a laboratory. And then I got to the track and I was like, 
thank heavens for this outlet just to step aside for a little bit to get a break from the studies and the calculus and the physics. So I do encourage uh, if you are into, you know, extracurricular things, it's definitely um, possible to do anything you want. You just got to follow your heart. Perfect. I love that. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay, from Gloria, how did you deal with failure when things didn't work out the way you wanted to? Paul, I know we were calling out gentlemen. If you want to take this one for the girls, that'd be great. Well, probably we'll look at it through the perspective of um, one of my daughters. Um, I have two daughters that are twins. Yeah, one of them uh, is very much into STEM. Uh, she is now in her second year of residency at Henry Ford, but the other one never was very good at, in the STEM area, but she had a vision. She is actually a music teacher. She had a vision that she wanted to go to the University of Illinois. In order to get in there, she had to have STEM side to it. She was never your best math student in high school, uh, but yet she took that failure and turned it into positive because she had a goal. So don't look at failure, look at it as opportunity and never give up the passion of what your goal is. And because of that, she is now um, a music teacher, but she also loves, just has a passion for teaching and teaching the next generation. And actually her school has tapped her to be a first grade teacher because of COVID they have needed some more first grade teachers. And though she was scared to death to do it, I kept telling her, but just tap into that background that you had of all those teachers that encourage you through your, through your youth. So never look at anything as a failure. Always look at it as an opportunity. Perfect, I love that. Kim Haney, I'm gonna call on you. Will you add on that for us? Um, I think that that's absolutely right, Paul, is that, you know, you know, I did not start off my career in a STEM related field at all. In fact, I grew up in a very small town in the middle of Kansas. And let me assure you, uh, the young people on this uh, phone who are growing up in Chicago had a very different uh, growing up experience than I did because, you know, we we passed a lot of uh, farm fields and um, a, a lot of land before we got anywhere in the morning. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that the opportunities that I availed myself to were really to get out of my comfort zone, try hard things, and to realize that, you know, the nice thing is, is that when you're young and you're trying new things is, so what if it doesn't work out? Oh, well, pick up and try something else. And, you know, I think that whether it is uh, some of the uh, young people on the call here that mentioned, you know, how they tried new things or had to overcome a, a challenge with either a tough customer, whether that customer is somebody you work with or somebody that is actually and truly a customer, you know, whether, um, you know, Vidika finding someone um, in the room to target and really prove herself to or to really just uh, change your approach with a particular tough customer, just whether it's a, a co-worker, a, a person in your class, a teacher or whomever, you just reset and change your approach if that person's approval is necessary for you to get ahead. And if they're not necessary for you to get ahead, who cares? Not everybody has to like you. So just, you know, brush it off and move on. So, um, you know, I think that uh, right now, especially with social media and maybe some isolation, not feeling like you're connecting with people, um, you know, be mindful of that. If you need to take a moment and reconnect with people in the call or, or in your class or reach out to one of us, um, you know, we've all been through probably a situation you're facing. We're happy to be supportive. And right now we're just really proud of you for showing up today and being part of this group. And Kim, to kind of pair, piggyback onto that, you know, also if it happens to be, if you're looking at a failure is it's because somebody's made some comment to you and, you've, and you're and you internalizing that, approach them, look at it. I mean, I'm gonna share something that happened to my one daughter, the, the one that is a um, in, med, in residency, she's actually in surgical residency. So to be a girl in surgical residency is pretty, pretty phenomenal. And she was working with a vascular surgeon about two weeks ago that was making some comments to her in the OR about how she was doing something. And instead of looking at that as a failure, 
she actually went into his office and asked him, can I come in and can you show me the technique by which you want me to use? So approach, you know, girls always approach everything because it's unfortunately, it's a man's world as Cheryl mentioned in the beginning of this, very few people that are actually, you know, women in meteorology. It's a man's world, but don't be afraid of men because most men out there do want to do nothing more than encourage you and move you forward. So never look at, is it, you know, as he's a man and I don't want to approach him, approach him. Most of the time, he's going to want to take you under your wing and show you. My daughter has found that all the way through um, medical school. And I had her here a couple of years ago when she was in her fourth year and all the girls swarmed around her because here's somebody, somebody that overcame being a cancer survivor and then went on to, to be a doctor. Great. Thank you, Paul. And I want to keep things moving in the um, effort of keeping us on schedule for today. I'd like each of our mentors to be able to jump in for a question. So if we can keep that in mind, we've got just a few more minutes here to wrap up the mentor session. Um, there was a question that I wanted to share with you all. Um, what are some of the best STEM universities or colleges? I think maybe just thinking about, and there was another student who asked about um, how important do you think the university you attend is to uh, pushing you and you to be, to be successful? So talk a little bit about how important where you choose to go to school is and finding that career path for you. Um, Kat, do you want to take this one for us? I know you haven't had a chance to join yet. Yes. Hi, my name is Kat Mako. I'm in the healthcare IT field. And I think it's important to uh, drive your desires and passions. Um, I'll take my personal experience. I actually attended a college in Denver and I'm in healthcare IT. So I think it's important to lead with your heart and um, wherever that path takes you. But I, as, as much as it is important for me personally speaking, I'm in healthcare IT on the sales side of the house. And I've learned a lot through the classes that I took and the different studies. But personally, I've led, um, my journey has been, um, well, for one in Denver, um, it was a business, in, um, a business major. Um, but I'm in healthcare IT today. So for me, personally speaking, I don't, it's important, but I think you can take whatever your passion is forward and be successful. Great advice. Michelle, I think you raised your hand as well. Would you share with the girls? Michelle, I'm not sure. It doesn't show you're on mute, but maybe turn your volume up for us. I think your phone is on mute. Okay, I'm gonna, we'll see if someone else can go and Michelle, maybe type in your answer in the chat. We'll see if that works that way. Kelly, I'm gonna call on you. I don't know if we've heard from you yet. If you would share um, information with the students for that, that'd be great. Jesse, is this any better? It is. There you go. Sorry about that, everyone. Hi, Michelle Panenko from Accenture. Um, I was just going to comment quickly on the question around, does the college that you go to really matter? And my perspective is that it's not about which school you go to. It's about what you're interested in and really kind of channeling, ch channeling yourself to focus on those specific areas, whether it's STEM, whether it's um, interest outside of STEM. I think school is our opportunity to learn and to experience different things. A lot of people commented on that. I actually was a philosophy major in college. That's pretty far away from STEM. And now I'm in the healthcare field. Um, you know, I ended up later on throughout uh, school um, towards my junior year, um, picking a business minor to supplement the philosophy degree. Um, but I think it's all about just, you know, channeling your interests. Um, and, and, and building onto that. And, and I think as an employer, when we hire, we don't look at you know, what skills that they really learn in college. It's more about the attitude. Is someone willing to learn? Are they gonna have the right attitude? Are they gonna be willing to take chances and um, sometimes to fail? And I think we all fail a little bit you know, every day and we push through it. And as long as we learn something from it, we become stronger as a result. So, so I think you know, 
my my advice is focus on you know what are you interested in and really take advantage and run with that versus you know the specific school that um, you know you're at. I think you could be successful regardless of what you decide to do from an education perspective. Great, thanks, Michelle. Beth, would you add on to that for us? Yeah, I was just gonna say, let's see, um, I went to the University of St. Thomas and when I when I did my undergraduate degree there, there was only three, uh, three gals out of the 80 uh, engineering uh, students there. Um, not a lot of people even knew that St. Thomas had an engineering program. So, um, you know, that kind of speaks to the, the point that it doesn't necessarily matter which uh, university or college you go to, it's, it's just the name, but it's, it's like Michelle said, all about the experiences you have, the attitude, uh, the advantage, you know, taking advantage of all the opportunities that, that you might have to really expand your network and try new things and learn new things and fail new ways. Um, so I, I think to uh, answer your question succinctly, no, I don't think it matters what university you go to for a STEM program. Great, thank you. Uh, I think I'm looking here. Wendy, would you like to add on for the girls? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Simondad, and I work for AHEAD. Um, I, I would echo um, kind of what's been said. So I went to a very small university in York, Pennsylvania. I majored in history, minored in computer science, um, and now I'm a senior technical consultant um, writing code every day for, for different clients. So I think your degree is important, what you learn is important, what you make of it, but in terms of, you know, the title of the university, um, I, I think it, it's more about who you are as a person and, and what you can bring and, and your eagerness to learn is, is so much more critical. I actually think when I look at uh, resumes personally, I'm looking at those things that were done outside of core curriculum that really shows your interest and shows that you really are eager to, to pursue that field um, because I think that's what drives success maybe versus the, the name of the college that you went to. So I think it's really all about what you make of it. Great, thank you so much. Okay, just a few more questions here so we get everybody an opportunity to answer. I'm just, just wondering, wondering, yeah. Can I just add one thing that I think most of the adults would uh, agree with on this call is that whatever you do, don't put yourself in huge amount of debt unless you feel like that that school that you go to is is for some reason and you and you get lots of counseling from other adults that you're sure that that debt is worth it. Whatever you do, don't start your young life off in, in big debt. It's just the pressure's not worth it. The practical side, Kim, thank you so much for sharing that. We're all, I see so many of the mentors laughing and smiling. Uh, that might be one of the biggest takeaways for the students, the financial wellness moving forward. So that's great. Um, we have a question on the side, I received one. How do we build a network specifically in times like this, um, virtual or not? Angela, would you help answer the question that for the students? Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, just be involved, right? Uh, you know, create a LinkedIn page, find groups that, you know, uphold the values and opportunities that you hope to seek out for yourselves. Join those groups, be a part of that online community. Right now, we've all had to, you know, experience some distance and we don't have the typical avenues that we did in the past in terms of connection, but there's a beautiful community online through LinkedIn, through various portals. So for all the young ladies today, I'd say start, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile already, create one, connect with us on there and seek, you know, groups and organizations that are, speak to what inspires you and, and follow them. There's tons of webinars that are, you know, being promoted on LinkedIn on a weekly basis. So Great, yeah, thank you. That's perfect. And Paula, I'm wondering, I'm not sure if we heard from you, would you mind adding on to that for the students or any other advice you'd like to share with them? I think that, um, and by the way, I'm Paula Elliott, I'm in healthcare IT. I, I think that you never know where you might find an opportunity to network. So you might, you know, you might be in a volunteer situation, you might be in a sports situation, 
uh, even you know if you're if you have a part time job or something. I think it's important to keep your eyes open and and uh, and your antenna up, if you will, to look for opportunities wherever they might be. In addition to uh, Angela, you know, describe the perfect uh, way to you know get involved in the in media and that sort of thing. But I think I think it's important to you know, maybe, you know, it's a friend of your parents or it's your doctor or it's your, you know, somebody that you come in contact with in your day-to-day -day life that might lead you to uh, an opportunity or a way to get to know other people to expand your horizons and your opportunities. Great, great, great advice. As we wrap up, I might just ask, a few of you to share some closing words. I know we have Kelly and Lauren that I'd love to hear from. Lauren, do you wanna share some uh, closing words with the students for today? Yes, absolutely. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Filarski. I apologize, I was on um, the wrong link to start out, but I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. I think, um, you know, we've heard a lot of great advice from everyone and, and looking back on, you know, where I was in your shoes in high school, um, I definitely had some teachers that helped uh, provide a lot of guidance and support. Um, and from a networking perspective, maybe there's somebody that you can reach out there um, asking about, you know, volunteer opportunities. A lot of the schools in our communities right now are, you know, virtual or hybrid, seeing if you can, you know, kind of tutor um, other, you know, young boys and girls in, in STEM areas, reaching out for opportunities. If you're looking to get into healthcare, um, you know, you may not be able to volunteer in a hospital right now, but they may have some unique ways um, to have them volunteer. Um, and I definitely, definitely agree on the college advice. Uh, the last thing, you know, you want um, kind of in our shoes is that debt. I paid off my college loans and was very happy to do so. But, um, you know, I definitely think, you know, the, the degree and what you're learning and how you're participating is the most important. And um, I know someone asked a question in here about um, being a woman um, in this field and kind of what we're seeing today. And one of the things I have two young uh, children at home. And one of the things that I've definitely seen is employers being much more um, inclusive. And my toddlers have been in videos and it's kind of nature today. And, um, you know, everyone is being very accepting. So I wish you all the very best. And um, I'm happy to connect with any of you via LinkedIn and, you know, support you in your journeys ahead. Thank you for having me today. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, Kelly, I'm going to ask you to wrap us up strong with a few closing remarks for the students and advice. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm Kelly Guglielmi. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Advocate Christ Down in the Hospital Medical Center. And I'll tell you, you know, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of this and I'm thinking back about when I was in high school and college and medical school and fellowship, residency. And, and I'll say all the way along the line, I think there's some common things that just don't change. And one of those is that I look upon failure as not necessarily failure, it's an opportunity, okay? If everything was easy and everybody got a trophy, we all know that the world doesn't exactly look that way. I think it's just so very important to realize that maybe you don't get in the first time or not, but it really is an opportunity to take a step back and think about, is this what I really want? If it's a particular college or what have you. And if it is, well then double down on your work and it's about working hard and um, finding people to support you. Um, I think about many years as a woman in uh, going to medical school, applying to medical school, and that was a time when um, it was certainly less than 20% were in medical school, were female. And I always had that sense of, um, over the years, the imposter syndrome. And I think a lot of women can relate to that, that, you know, do I really, am, am I, did they pick the right person? Am I the right person for this? Am I qualified? And you are. And Many times we feel as if we don't necessarily belong and are, are the right person for that spot. But if you're there, you are. And if you've been chosen, you are. And I think it's reminding ourselves that we're as qualified as anyone else. And um, every opportunity that's brought forth to us is there for an opportunity to learn. And I think that, you know, the fact that you're even showing up today for this 
says a lot. And uh, taking that time out of your day to think about it and hearing from some obviously extraordinarily accomplished women is just tremendous. So I think um, I've learned even just listening and resonated with a lot of the commentary. So um, good luck to all of you. And I'm quite confident you will do well. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I feel like we need a round of applause to end this out. You all have been amazing. I know that the students, um, certainly I imagine, are very grateful for you all joining us today. We will do our best um, to connect everybody offline. Great advice for the students. Thank you all. Um, like I said, we will connect everybody after the event as much as possible and hopefully be able to um, move some of these students towards their career path. So thank you all so very much. Uh, mentors, you are welcome to stay on. Just please turn off your video and mute your mic. Otherwise, you are released to the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Students will continue the program. Carol, I will toss it back to you. Oh, that was amazing. As many just said, I learned a lot from today. Uh, what an incredible team here of mentors and realize that you have us as your resource now and happy to be amongst that team. Um, next, I am happy to introduce Jennifer Curtis from Schneider Electric. Part of today is to showcase the many job opportunities that ultimately impact healthcare. Let's take a look at how an electric company helps keep the lights on and save lives. Hi everyone, my name is Jen Curtis. I lead university recruiting at Schneider Electric. I'm so thrilled to be here with you today to share how the company I work for plays an integral role when it comes to health for the communities here in Chicago. We strongly believe that great people make Schneider Electric a great company, a community of people inspired by a meaningful purpose, inclusive culture, and empowerment of our teams. Schneider is happy to partner with the American Heart Association because we believe in the mission to educate women around the risks for heart disease, and also the need to close gender gap when it comes to careers in STEM fields. Today's an important day for us because we believe we have the opportunity to showcase what we do in the hopes of inspiring you to think outside the box when it comes to your future and the impact that you want to make. Schneider Electric focuses on energy management and industrial automation, but did you know that we're responsible for powering many of the hospitals in Chicago? During this pandemic, we've helped power the places that have cared for so many through keeping their buildings sustainable, efficient, and green. Let's take a look at a video to learn more. When lives depend on the reliable, uninterrupted flow of power, there's no room for even a momentary outage. In this local hospital, with patients scheduled for surgery, it's critical that the power remains consistent under any conditions. A power outage can endanger patient lives, as well as the hospital's financial health and reputation. This hospital can count on reliable power thanks to the EcoStructure Power Solutions delivered and implemented by Schneider Electric and their EcoExpert partners trained and certified in critical power solutions for healthcare facilities. To prepare for the approaching storm, the facility manager uses EcoStructure Power Monitoring Expert to monitor the entire electrical distribution system and fuel levels for his backup generators. Because he recently ran an emergency power supply system test, he knows that this backup power is ready to take over if a power failure occurs so that life-saving operations can continue as planned. He also knows his MV equipment is in good condition thanks to continuous monitoring and advice he receives from EcoStructure Asset Advisor. A storm hits hard, causing power outages throughout the city and affecting the hospital's MV supply. The automated transfer switch immediately changes the supply source to the backup generators. During the switchover period to the generator, the UPS Galaxy VM provides immediate backup power, ensuring that there are no interruptions to ongoing surgeries and procedures. Around the world, millions of patients undergo surgery every year, and they all trust their lives to the hospital serving them. From connected products and edge control software to apps, analytics, and services, our IoT-enabled EcoStructure Power Architecture provides tailored solutions that simply work. Our commitment to innovation at every level ensures connectivity, reliability, efficiency, safety, and sustainability. That's why Schneider Electric is a preferred solution provider for hospitals and healthcare organizations around the world. Because with us, life is on. I hope you enjoyed the video. My hope is to share with you that there are so many career opportunities like mine at Schneider that influence health. 
They're like-minded organizations that care about the well-being of their employees and participate with nonprofits like the American Heart Association to help build a healthier future. You don't have to be a nurse or a doctor to have an impact on health. You could be an engineer, you could be a health segment director or a customer advocate, or you can work in HR like myself. Um, first of all, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for hearing the Schneider Electric story. Just a few closing thoughts for you. Keep pursuing your dreams and know that you have mentors and leaders who are willing to help you explore jobs. Like engineering are really roles that you're just dreaming of. It takes a village to keep our hearts beating. Thank you and enjoy your day. Wow, that was fascinating. Thank you so much, Jennifer. STEM offers so many different career paths that you may never have thought of before. Thank you, Schneider Electric, for sharing. It's time now for another pop quiz. Put your answers in the chat. The American Heart Association relies on volunteers, staff, donors, and partners to help foster a smart, collaborative environment. Successful organizations make the most of diversity and inclusion to deliver programs, events, and educational opportunities that support a culturally competent workforce that delivers on its mission. Do you know the difference between diversity and inclusion? Share your thoughts in the comments now. So if anyone wants to just share their thoughts quickly on the difference between diversity and inclusion, and we will talk a little bit about that before we move on to the next question. Diversity is the various unique aspects of something. Great, oh, the answers are streaming in so fast. I can't even come up, here we go from Lucia. Diversity is the difference between people. Inclusion is to interact with everyone and listen to them. That is a great answer. Mallory states diversity is where there are different types of people on the basis of culture, race, gender, religion, and inclusion is where an effort to make those different types of people involved and engaged in the same setting. Uh, amazing answers, guys. You are on it. Diversity refers to the traits and characteristics that make people unique, while inclusion refers to the behaviors and social norms that ensure people feel welcome. So something to always think about. So let's go on to the next question. Research suggests that members of LGBTQ community face health disparities linked to social stigma, societal stigma, discrimination, and denial of civil and human rights. True or false question here. Discrimination faced by the LGBTQ community has been associated with high rates of tobacco use and vaping. Mark your answers in the chat. Okay, seeing your answers stream in live as we speak right now, I'm seeing a lot of truths. And if you are answering true, you are correct. Many types of mental health issues can affect heart disease risk. So it's important to raise awareness and gain a thorough understanding of the health challenges faced by this vulnerable community. Thank you for participating in these questions. I would now like to introduce our next session, which will highlight the importance of diversity in STEM jobs led by U Chicago Medicine. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, James, for joining us for our fifth annual Go Red, Go STEM and our first ever digital experience. Uh, it's great to have you joining us today. Um, as we get started, uh, we know that University of Chicago Medicine is at the forefront of leading diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we're thankful that James Williams was able to join us today. Uh, for this brief conversation around what the University of Chicago Medicine is doing and what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. So James, if you don't mind, we're going to jump right on in. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do, how you got there, you know, are you from Chicago? Just, you know, give us the whole thing. Absolutely. Hi, um, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, so I was born here in Chicago, have lived all my life on the South Side, and came to the University of Chicago Medicine back in 
1988. Um, it's interesting. It's very close to where I used to live when I, when I was a teenager. My mom worked here, and my uncle even went to the University of Chicago back in the day. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. And how did you, I guess, get to where you are today at University of Chicago? Well, uh, I started out in finance a long, long time ago and um, had an opportunity to work in our transplant team. And so while we were actually starting our heart transplant program, I was part of that team kind of working in the finance space, um, managed our admission services area, worked in what we call supply chain. Some people call it purchasing. And then I had the opportunity to um, kind of launch our business diversity office, kind of building business relationships with minority and women-owned companies. And then when Brenda Battle came to the organization, she asked me to lead the enterprise-wide diversity, inclusion, and equity strategy. Wow, that's amazing. So uh, I guess a few things. What exactly is the Urban Health Initiative at the University of Chicago Medicine? Sure, sure. Our Urban Health Initiative is really kind of our community health department. We partner and work with residents um, across the, the city, predominantly on the south side, but, but everywhere because we get patients from everywhere. And what we do is we really try to understand from their perspective, you know, what are the community health needs and where can we best support them in, in building and improving health. And so we're about 40 some odd people strong working both inside and outside of the, of the hospital to help reduce health disparities or where there are differences. And as we say, it kind of advance health equity where everybody gets what they need. Right. And so wh why would you say that's important? It's really important because when we look at the health disparities on the south side of Chicago, I'll just pick asthma as one, we see that there's a much higher percentage of our youth that are suffering from asthma, um, missing school, parents having to take off work in order to take care of their kids. And, and we see that other areas, they don't have such a high percentage or prevalence of, of asthma. And so we see that disparity and, and feel like it's our role to help reduce that disparity or eliminate it and, and, and really support working with the community and others in improving health. Right. So I heard you mention asthma as one of your priorities for the Urban Health Initiative. Any other major priorities you have in the community? Yeah, absolutely. So asthma is one, one big one. Um, but beyond that, what we do is uh, we work on diabetes because there's also a high prevalence of diabetes in our neighborhoods. And so we that's one, one other area of focus. Excuse me, another area of focus for us is violence recovery and resilience. Um, we live in a violent society and individuals are impacted by that. So we want to help build resilience with, with those families. Uh, mental health is another area where we see uh, disparities as well as access to care uh, when, when people need it. Food insecurity, um, there are a lot of individuals and families that are start struggling for that and then employment. So we have opportunity to, to support community residents and, and community organizations to address all of those particular areas. Gotcha, sounds really good. So kind of shifting gears just a little bit, Tell me a little bit more about what is like the diversity, inclusion, the equity department? What do those words mean? And if I'm a 16 year old, what does that mean for me? How am I applying that in my day to day? And as I'm looking forward in my future career? Absolutely. So we look at diversity as just a fact of life. Everybody is created unique. And so however an individual identifies race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, whatever, where they, where they went to school and where they live, all of these things are part of who an individual is, the skills that they learn and the like. And so diversity is just a fact. What we're really trying to do at the University of Chicago Medicine through our work is really create an inclusive organization so that whoever comes to us feels welcomed, they feel safe, they feel that they're being respected in the way that they want to be respected as a person and that they're, they're valued, that their ideas and that their skills and, and their experiences are really valued in our organization. We serve patients from all over the world. We serve a large percentage of patients from the South Side of Chicago. And so for individuals that have that experience and those skills, we really need them. We want them to know that we're a place where we value that because that's what we need in order to take care of the patients that we have the privilege of caring for. Um, equity, I'll just touch on that one little piece, mm -hmm. is, is how do we make sure that everybody is being treated fairly, 
and that they have access to resources to develop and access to resources for opportunities for advancement. And so we really want to create an equitable organization. So that's kind of diversity, inclusion, and equity in a nutshell. Gotcha. Any way that a 16-year-old or a high school student could get, could get involved in diversity, inclusion, and equity in their day-to-day -day lives? So one point. of the ways, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the ways that we share some of the work that we're doing at the, in the Urban Health Initiative, because I'm kind of under the umbrella of the Urban Health Initiative, is we put out a weekly newsletter that anybody with an email can subscribe to and get updates on what's going on in the community, what's happening from a COVID perspective, what type of community programs might they, their family, their, where they worship or other um, individuals might be able to take advantage of it. So really, because we come in contact with people that want to do well, they want to um, be part of, of a solution, one way is to be kind of in touch and co constant communication with us, even as, a, even, even as a teenager to understand what's going on. What are we doing in the high schools? What are we doing with um, college students that might want to potentially work or, or in either in our organization or be part of you know, a community organization? So that's one concrete way that people can kind of stay in touch with us no matter how old they are. Gotcha. Sounds really good. So I know you've talked a little bit about the importance of the Urban Health Initiative, the importance of uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. So I'm really curious. So what are you working on currently? What does your day-to-day -day look like? Um, my day-to-day -day is very interesting. So um, I'll share one piece um, from today. So one of the things we do, we work inside and outside the organization. And so as we're in the, in the community understanding what's happening in, in the space of asthma, what's happening in the space of diabetes, I'm also on the inside of the organization saying, hey, to our clinical teams and to our administrative teams, we can look at what's happening with the patients that come to see us. And are we seeing disparities in asthma are we seeing disparities in hypertension, blood pressure control? And what can we do inside the organization so that we can meet the unique needs of each and every patient that comes to visit us? So I actually set up systems working with our data team, working with our quality team so we can see if there are disparities. And then we help to train them to help identify them and then work with patients to understand why those are happening and then helping them to improve their health. And so the same things that we're doing in the community to understand and address health disparities and improve health, I'm doing inside the organization in deep collaboration to identify and um, address disparities so that we are, again, giving each patient what they need for them to be their most healthy self. Gotcha. Any other major projects you're currently working on? Sure. So one of the things that, um, that we're working on now excuse me, is, is, is um, in hypertension. We, we recognize that um, some of our um, patients in the community, some of our community members and patients are struggling with managing hypertension. And so what we've been doing is we've been calling them to ask them what are the barriers and what are the things that help you to manage your blood pressure and sharing that information with our, with our doctors and nurses, et cetera, and, and, and educators so that we can support them um, another thing that we're looking at is how do we care for our patients that are suffering with sickle cell disease? Mm -hmm. This is something that plagues um, not only our community, but other communities. And how are we addressing that? And what can we do in partnership with people to address those things for hypertension? And one other thing that came up as we talked about asthma is we have a Southside Pediatric Asthma Center where people can call, get resources on how to manage asthma, um, and we also have a community health worker program where our community health workers talk with, they used to go into the homes, but now due to COVID, we, we still talk with and share how families can manage asthma for their, um, for their kids in order to really improve their health. And so we have many, many opportunities to do that across all of the areas where we see problems and health disparities. Right. I, I was going to say, it seems like you all are doing a lot of work in improving health disparities and really driving that, that key word you mentioned earlier, equity that you mentioned. So like you're doing a lot of work to kind of uh, create equity within communities and, and uh, decrease health disparities. Um, so as we kind of wrap up, last question. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that you're a father of three. So I'd love to know, as we've talked about the Urban Health Initiative, we've talked about diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion. I'm sure you've had some of these very same conversations with your own children. So what advice would you give these young adults uh, 
today that would help them ex succeed academically in their communities, in their careers, and as they kind of move throughout life? Yeah, yeah, I would say there are probably three major things. Um, you know, one is to be diligent across all of your all of your studies. You know, sometimes we have a preference for math or a preference for a different um, subject. But what I've encouraged um, and what I encourage everyone to do is kind of try, try your best and be really diligent about all of them, because even things that you don't necessarily like, even things that are extremely difficult, if you actually do the work to go through it, you're developing um, perseverance. You're developing grit, you're developing problem solving skills. And wherever you choose to specialize, you're going to need those problem solving skills in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, you need those problem solving skills. And so I would just encourage you to encourage um, the students to, in, to, to be diligent across all of those. Another piece that I would encourage them to do is um, start building relationships that uh, with not only your, your teachers, um, whether they are you know, the best or, or the worst in your opinion, um, building relationships with teachers, building relationships actually with, su with um, some of your students. I've come to know that people that I didn't necessarily get along with um, earlier in life, later on, those differences didn't matter because we were all more mature and we had come to a point where, you know what, we can help each other. We can work together. And so I would encourage them to build, build relationships with students, teachers, professional individuals. I'll even leave my email address if individuals want to want to stay in contact with me I'm happy to share what I've learned in that particular space because I think those are the things that um that are really really helpful and then the, the last thing I'll say is um embrace change you know try new things in high school and in college you have an opportunity to broaden your horizons and do different types of things um, that will help you create what we call kind of like a frame of reference so Having experienced a lot of different things, when you get into a new environment, say a new school or a new job, or you move, your family moves to a new area, um, you'll have some things, some things that you can talk about to build common relationships with people that are that are new to you. And so embrace change, kind of really build your network. This is actually something that Michelle Obama um, shared with me when I used to report to her. She said, you know, I have my network, you need to build yours. And so I would encourage others, and I was, you know, 20, 30 something. I can't remember. I was old. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I think that's great advice. And I share that with my children. I would share with any any teenager, um, start building your network. Names, numbers, email addresses, or social media handles are things that will later on potentially be very benefit, beneficial for you. So those are the three things that I would recommend. All right. Thank you so much, James, for joining us today. Thank you so much for joining our first ever Digital Go Red Go STEM event. Uh, it was a pleasure having you learning a little bit more about what the uh, Urban Health Initiative does, learning more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then learning more about you and, and getting some great advice along the way. So thank you again. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Go Red, go STEM. <laughs>Thank you so much for your insight, you Chicago Medicine team. Your message is so important and we are so grateful you are sharing it far and wide, especially with this future group of lifesavers. Speaking of, we want everyone here today to feel empowered to take action if ever the need arises. Let's learn how easy it is to save a life. Hey everyone, I'm Jocko Sims. You might know me as Dr. Reynolds on the show, New Amsterdam. You know, I've learned quite a bit playing a doctor. For example, I've learned that when someone is having a cardiac arrest, every minute counts, and survival depends on immediately receiving CPR. Did you know that 70% of cardiac arrests happen in homes? And with many of us spending more and more time at home these days, it's all the more important to know what to do in a cardiac emergency. Let me show you a technique that I learned from the American Heart Association. It's called hands-only CPR. It involves two easy steps that can save the life of someone you love. Here's how it goes. Hey guys. <laughs> so if you see a teen or an adult collapsed and unresponsive, first call 911 or ask someone to. Second, you wanna push hard and fast in the center of the chest. Now, you might be asking how hard and how fast. That's a good question. You wanna go two inches deep and about as fast as an upbeat song like 
Staying Alive by the Bee Gees, or Crazy in Love by Beyonce. Here we go. Now the key is to keep your arms straight. You don't want to go bending your elbows like that, right? Here we go. Let's run through that one more time. If you see a teen or an adult collapsed and unresponsive, what's the first thing you do? That's right, call 911. Second, you push hard and fast in the middle of the chest, just like I showed you. Thank you, American Heart Association and Children's Hospital Los Angeles for collaborating to bring this important message to the public. Remember, you could be the difference for someone you love. Wow, just two steps to save a life. I hope you all feel empowered to help in case of emergency. Please share these critical steps with your friends and family. We are going to switch gears to a very important health topic that is directly impacting teens like yourselves. The American Heart Association is fighting for the country's young people and against the vaping epidemic by funding millions in new nicotine research, working to strengthen laws and exposing the e-cigarette industry's lies. Vaping can damage the lungs, respiratory system, heart, and brain. We have a message from one of your peers about the dangers of vaping. Kids usually start the habit because they see others doing it. It's kind of like an influence thing, but also it's the marketing behind it. So um, when students see this marketing about, ooh, this new thing, this new vape, this new e-cigarette, this new tobacco is very calming for you or it's more healthier for you. That's when students, they get attracted to it because the marketing of it. I see them becoming more addicted to it. So therefore that means, of course, the company is gaining a lifelong customer and then they don't see it coming right now, but my friends, their health is becoming more bad because of that. Such a strong message. You can find tons of resources at www.heart.org slash tobacco if you or a friend need help to kick this deadly habit. I'd like to now introduce you to all two very special women, one who has been working as a volunteer with AHA and Go Red for Women to share the importance of education and heart health who suffered a stroke last year, and another young woman who is not only a survivor, but is also a student attendee of today's event. Event. Let's hear their incredible stories of survival. My name is Hannah Pico. I attend Joy West High School as a part of the sophomore class. Before getting into my testimonial, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself and my background. I have lived in the Joliet area my whole life. I was born at Provena Hospital, but more commonly known as today as Amita Health. I participate in two varsity sports at West and aspire to be an ER physician when I grow up. The Go Red Go STEM application process was a very personal experience to me due to the fact that my grandfather had two heart attacks in his mid-40s. In 2005, my mother was going into labor. During labor, my shoulders were stuck and my airway was cut off. The doctors immediately rushed my mom and I to an immediate C-section surgery. After, I was put into the ICU for months and I had a better death rate than a survival rate. With my own health issues and my family's health complications and my love for medicine, it was a no-brainer that I wanted to become a doctor and be in the medical field. I would like to give the care I once received to people in need one day. Thank you for this opportunity, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kristen Aguirre, and I'm a young stroke survivor. I suffered my stroke at the age of 31 while taking a nap. I left the entire left side of my body paralyzed, but luckily I've been able to regain most of my movement back. I love working with American Heart Association because it's working hard to bust the myth that strokes only happen to the elderly. 
and it's also working hard to spread awareness so people know the symptoms of stroke so they can act fast if they ever think they're having one. I think it's so important for women to be involved in the STEM industry because it's a reminder that it's really girls who run the world. Wow, thank you so much, Kristen and Hannah, for sharing your incredible stories and why you got involved with STEM and the American Heart Association. I'd like to now introduce our next session, which consists of some pretty amazing women from BMO Harris. Hey, everyone. We're so excited to be speaking with the future leaders in STEM. As women working within male-dominated fields, we know that finding personal success is certainly gonna look different for everyone. Um, but we hope today that our personal perspectives will help you with your own navigation through this field. Yasmin and I are both uh, working at BMO Harris Bank currently in Chicago, working from home these days, as you can see my, by my background. Um, but we're both in the financial services industry and thought we could tell you a little bit about our perspectives. Yasmin, why don't you uh, tell the group a little bit about yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Yasmin Blanton. I'm currently the head of U.S. Technology Delivery for BMO Personal and Business Banking. I have 20 plus years of technology leadership in the financial services industry. And every day I'm excited about uh, building and delivering digital mobile core products to make our customers' lives better and help them use their money wisely and in the best way. I've been a mentor, a champion advocate for women and diverse talent in STEM my whole career. So I'm very excited to be here today. Yes, very excited. And yes, and I know that when we were talking earlier, you mentioned you have a daughter who's in STEM too. So certainly a very timely topic for, for you personally as well. Um, a little bit about me, everyone. Um, I'm Elizabeth Buckton. I graduated in 2013 with a major in finance and economics. Um, while I was in school, a uh, career in finance didn't really seem, uh, or I thought it was going to be more investment banking or you know stock trading focused. Um, I certainly liked numbers and liked the financial analytics, but knew that I wanted to really have a, a relationship with my clients. Um, so when I joined BMO Wealth Management in 2015, I worked my way from associate to advisor, and now I manage a book of my own um, 100 or so high net worth clients, um, individuals, and families. Really one of my favorite parts about this job is linking the client data and my, to my strategic outreach so that I'm working smarter, not harder. That's actually great to hear, Elizabeth. And of course, certainly, you know, with COVID, so many things changed. Uh, we've seen an incredible change to the way we live, the way we work, we collaborate. And COVID has changed so many aspects of our daily lives and also as a financial services company, how we serve our customers. Um, so let me ask you, um, what advice do you have for our students today as they navigate through building their expertise and finding opportunities during this time? Wow, well, I would definitely like to tell you all that you are not alone right now, and nor do you have to be navigating this, this unprecedented land by yourself. Um, I think that one of the best pieces of advice that I received early on in my career was to diversify my circles and find a strong mentor. Now, obviously, you can be more deliberate with diversifying your circles, um, which really allows you to gain new perspectives on not only yourself, but also assists in your career and personal development. Um, outside of my role within the bank, I volunteered on various internal process improvement committees. I've gained memberships to our various um, employee resource groups within BMO. Um, I'm actually a, a member of the BMO Pride Committee here. Um, and finally, I also volunteer my time outside of BMO. As a matter of fact, I'm a member of the, the uh, AHA Associates Board. So definitely wanting to always diversify um, my perspectives and who I'm meeting because you never know what could come your way and what opportunities could come from where. Um, I will say that in terms of finding a, mem or a mentor, that, that certainly happens kind of more organically along the way, but, but always something that you should be looking out for as well. 
Yeah, those are great points, Elizabeth. And as we adapt to working remotely, um, as you know, uh, we're also updating our programs like our technology summer internship program. Uh, we've uh, actually had a great group of diverse students um, this summer that allowed them to learn and grow. And uh, in technology, we're working very hard to plan the program for next year. So we're very excited. And even though the format changed a bit, we still provide a lot of interesting problems to solve and enable our interns to work side by side with us, um, the BMO teams, to build the digital technology of the present um, and future. So another question that comes to my mind is, as we're working from home, in our home offices and with our other family members, we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. How do we take care uh, of ourselves uh, becomes also very important. So we can always be the best version of ourselves. What do you do for yourself uh, during this time and what recommendations mm -hmm. do you have for our students today? Yeah, definitely. I think that now more than ever, it's really important to to take care of yourself. I, I, I like to give my self an opportunity to step away from my home office, which is often hard, but but try to be deliberate with that so I can be my best self when I'm on and, and at work and working with my clients. Um, but I think more than that, it's really important to develop a manageable process and sticking to it. I know that before the lockdown, I organized my client book into various um, actionable segments. So I have a women's part of my book. I have business owners, retirees, and so on. And what I did was I developed a process for ongoing and proactive outreach with these groups. Um, on our floor, we call it being pleasantly persistent so that when you know something unprecedented like the, the pandemic comes along, you're still able to maintain those ongoing important relationships that keeps our business going. Um, before the lockdown, I would use events and entertainment to form and grow my relationships. And now I'm contacting my clients from a different medium, virtually. And a lot of these clients are not used to this virtual world. Um, but I still approach these with the same genuine care and concern for them and their families. And these are uncertain times to be able to maintain an empathetic approach and provide my clients with peace of mind makes a huge impact in their lives. So take care of yourself so that you can continue to take care of your clients is, is what, I, what I try to do. Yeah, most definitely. Very well said, uh, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to remind uh, ourselves again, we're here for the long run. And again, I know uh, there are a lot of different programs uh, that many of our team members, either in technology or business, tap, can tap into. Uh, for example, I know uh, the company um, created a wellness at Vimo program, uh, which has been very beneficial uh, to support the physical, mental, um, financial, and social well-being of everyone. And there's now a consolidated website of tools and resources and, you know, information and recommendations. So there's definitely a lot that we can tap into. And then we can uh, also reach out to each other, uh, to your point, to build those relationships, to grow the relationships, and just generally take care of ourselves and take care of uh, each other. So um, we, have a sh we have a short segment today, so we're at the end of our time. So it's been really great talking to you uh, today. Um, and personally, I hope everybody stays safe uh, during this time and well uh, during the pandemic. And to all of the students, I um, hope again, you'll continue to explore the subjects and careers that you're passionate about and we'll be here to support you. Thank you so much, BMO Harris. I'd now like to introduce Maggie Daniels, Partner Account Manager of AHEAD. Maggie, your team has supported this initiative from inception, and we are grateful to partner with an organization committed to the health and well-being of its employees and commitment to educate more women in STEM fields. I know you have a great message to share on identifying your dreams and making them a reality. Hi everybody, my name is Maggie Daniels and I work for AHEAD, a top sponsor for today's Go Red Go STEM event. I'm here today to talk to you about taking an idea and making it a reality. To give you a little background on who I am, my role at AHEAD is Partner Account Manager, 
which means that I manage some of our top partnerships with companies like Cisco, AppDynamics, and ServiceNow, to name a few. I've been in the technology industry for nearly a decade, and I also have my MBA. I've worked in sales, marketing, and business development over the years, but my proudest accomplishment is creating a AHEAD's first employee resource group called Moving Women Ahead. Today, Moving Women Ahead is dedicated to advancing women in technology by fostering a diverse, inclusive environment. Our focus is providing leadership development, networking, and mentoring opportunities for people at all stages of their career. Today, I wanted to rewind to a few years ago and tell you the story of how this organization came to be. In March of 2018, a group of women at AHEAD were chatting in our internal Slack channel, wishing each other a, a happy International Women's Day. During our conversation, I mentioned that I wish we had a more formal way to celebrate this special day together. The other women agreed and wanted to begin meeting regularly and getting to know each other better. The idea could have easily turned into a fleeting moment, but I decided that I wanted to seize this opportunity. I yearned to showcase my leadership skills to my organization and my passion for uplifting women in technology made for the perfect opportunity to make this idea into a reality. As a first step, I decided to organize a brainstorm session with the women to understand what we all wanted out of this formalized group. Once we got our thoughts down on paper, our ideas started coming to fruition. I organized an internal monthly forum where we could meet regularly and discuss various topics surrounding career and personal development. Additionally, we hosted our first external event open to our partners and customers in June of 2018. The event featured a speaking slot from a female VP at our top partner, Dell, where she spoke about the importance of mentorship. Following our first event, we regularly hosted external events nearly every quarter. The types of events varied from networking, panelist discussions, and hosting local nonprofits focused on diversity in STEM. As our group develop, developed, we decided to brand ourselves in 2019, which is where our name Moving Women Ahead came from. We created a mission statement, a logo, detailed goals for the year, and we formed a leadership team to carry out these goals. Forming a leadership team was key to our success. We were able to get together on a regular basis to ensure we were on task and meeting goals and ensuring that the group remained an asset to the company as a whole. One of our biggest accomplishments to date was hosting an event in September 2019 called Ahead in Motion. The event was jointly hosted by Moving Women Ahead and another employee resource group recently formed called Rise Ahead, which is dedicated to diversity in tech. The event focused on bringing our clients partners, and communities together to empower marginalized groups, and we featured various guests, including Vanessa Williams, as our keynote speaker. As it stands today, Moving Women Ahead continues to hold virtual forums and events and remains an asset to the company. At the start of 2020, I received a promotion at Ahead and decided to give someone else a shot at leadership. I passed the baton of president onto another woman so that they may work towards their own career goals. However, I remain a member of the leadership team and an integral part of the organization. I hope my story inspires you to grab hold of an idea and make it a reality. If you have the drive and passion for an idea, you can make anything happen. Thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful day. Well, thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you all so much for joining our fifth annual Chicago Go Red, Go STEM event. It's so important for us to support organizations who help create a healthier future for all. We hope you leave empowered to take control of your future and seek out a career in STEM. I know I speak on behalf of everyone here today and all of the mentors that it was our privilege and we are honored to be here with you today. And now you have a powerful network with you. We will see you next year and hopefully it's in person, but it was a great digital virtual experience being here with all of you today.